when, when this opportunity first came up, it occurred to me that uh, Maxine has a tendency to come through New York and through AWW events uh, in time for sort of crucial moments of our organization's history. Um, before I was actually involved with the workshop, uh, she came and received our first Lifetime Achievement Award uh, in an event that uh, we co-sponsored with the National Book Foundation and NYU as well um, for our 15th anniversary. And then about five years ago, uh, she came for our 20th anniversary, um, and that was the year that we first started restarting our fellowships and our online magazines. And the following year, um, she joined us to a delegation at the Arizona border for a week, uh, which led to the formation of an organization called Culture Strike. And in fact, one of my memories of Maxine, uh, when I think about one of the last times I saw her, was um, being at the Arizona border, where she and Teju Cole were engaged in vigorous debate with a beefy border guard holding an assault rifle. Um, needless to say, we all survived the experience. Um, <laughs> And now she's here uh, for the Asian American Writers Workshop's 25th anniversary, um, which is the 25th anniversary in the same way that this is the 40th anniversary of The One Warrior, which is to say it happened like a year or two ago. Um, and in this year, we have a lot of exciting things um, and we're growing expansively. We're starting brand new Muslim community programs. We just launched our Muslim Communities Fellows. Uh, we have special programs that uh, take place in NYCHA public housing, senior centers, high schools, and we're also in the process of launching our new uh, anthology that we're co-publishing with the Feminist Press called Go Home. Um, so it's a very exciting moment. We're going to have a lot more things in store for the 25th anniversary. Um, but I want to thank all of you for being here for what could be the kickoff of that anniversary celebration. Um, okay, so enough boring stuff about AWW. I'm going to say a few short words about The One Warrior. Maxine will read. Uh, if you're in the audience, start thinking about questions for when Monique and Maxine uh, have the moderation. And you, who are in the intertubes, think about questions as well. And someone will ask them, I hope. Um, I was thinking about the woman warrior and how uh, what often gets left out is the subtitle, A Girlhood Among Ghosts. Um, and when the first Asian American immigrants came to the United States, one of the names they had for the country was the land without ghosts. By this, they meant the country's cultural and ruthless newness that obliterated all traditions. But of course, as many of you know, in various Chinese dialects, the epithet uh, ghost is what one uses to describe the Western barbarian. Uh, so in the title, A Girlhood Among Ghosts, the ghosts are not just the mysterious demons that come from a supernatural world, the ghosts are also Americans. The ghost stands in also for the immigrant stories, the secrets of the diaspora that hang in the air like scents, and also the sense of being the innervated, deracinated second generation person who is sort of transparent and uh, leeching out the secrets and stories of the past. Um, I was thinking about The Woman Warrior and rereading it for this event, and I was shocked at how I always thought it was an amazing book, but it was even better than I had remembered. It was wilder, more terrifying, more elemental, more heartbreaking, more ironic, and more satirical. One Asian American professor once said to me that if Asian American literature had to have a canonical book, how awesome was it that it would be The Woman Warrior, a book that's unapologetically weird and feminist and political and avant-garde, and also a book that possesses those most rare effects that you don't usually associate with Asian Americans, emotions like anger and triumph. Um, but I was also struck by how timely the book still feels and how it could have been written yesterday in a lot of ways. This is partly but not entirely because it is so politically relevant. Um, there are scenes that take place uh, at the border uh, with immigrants trying to gain entry and trying to find the right password that will unlock entry into this country. Um, in one scene, uh, Maxine's character encounters a fellow student who's just released from internment. And in a way that might resonate in the sort of post-Occupy, Elizabeth Warren age, uh, the Fa Mulan in the story is one who leads a peasant revolt for the people. But this is not exactly why it felt new. It felt new because there's something about magic and wonders that feels always new. Um, and there's nothing that dates so quickly as realism. 
Um, I was recently reading this book of uh, Tibetan magical spells that Penguin Classics put out. And I was delighted to learn that one magic trick that you could learn as a Tibetan Buddha saint was a magic trick called wonder making. And that's when I realized that that's what Maxine's work is about, the creation of wonders. Um, like a medieval cabinet of curiosities, every paragraph kind of lights on something strange and new and delightful. Um, so I guess what I want to talk about is maybe one or two ways where Maxine creates wonders and in fact is a shaman. Um, and what does it mean for her to kind of generate that special Maxine magic? It occurred to me that one task of the shaman is to intuit those infinite forces that are beyond our ordinary perceptions. And in The Woman Warrior, you have the sense of something almost beyond what can be spoken. The uncanny supernatural horror that lies just beyond reality. The female Avenger's fury, a recasting of that madness that has been often gendered as female hysteria. And the spectral melancholia of the immigrant isolated among ghosts. There's a part in the book where in third person, um, she and her siblings are described as secretive and antisocial. Um, and when I first met Maxine, she actually said she wrote The Woman Warrior as a sort of memoir because she said she didn't know how to write a conventional novel. So she thought she would just write it as an essay. And so if The Woman Warrior is all of this infinity and elemental forces compacted into the nonfiction form, uh, I really encourage you to read Maxine's poetry where that force is sort of unleashed. Um, the format is removed and what we have is to quote uh, her last book, A Broad Margin to Her Life. This is a sense of living life and writing poetry to its fullest, um, to write beyond form, uh, to write like one character she cites in the book, Walt Whitman, someone who loves everyone and who loves every place. I think the role of the poet in some ways is the vocation of freedom and love and liberty. And I think that's a sense that we get, especially in Maxine's poetry. The other task of the shaman is something that sounds rather psychotic, which is to hear voices and imagine conversations with people who are not here. In other words, to be a novelist. Well, the woman warrior has a strange uh, role of being the avant-garde text probably most read by high school students and college freshmen. And it kind of emerged in this strange time of the, the early days of multiculturalism where everyone needed the urge to be represented and to see themselves in a representation. But what does it mean in that context when you possess a kind of volcanic creativity, the urge to imagine beyond representation, which is fundamentally a realist mode of thinking? There is a tendency to think about ethnic literature as a mode of anthropology. Um, if you are a writer of color, you're asked to write what you know, as though you're simply reporting data from the field. And in this first chapter of The Woman Warrior, uh, the story, Maxine recovers the story of a woman who is murdered, a woman who has no name, who has no kind of anthropological data to tell, but writes it using both a mix of fantasy and satirical anthropological theory. In the next chapter, she becomes a wuxia warrior. In the chapter after that, her mother fights ghosts. There's a sense that when you write history from below, it's not enough to write it as testimony, but you can write it as fantasy as well. Um, the book, as many people know, starts with a famous line of Maxine's mother telling her, you must not tell anyone what I'm about to tell you. And ironically, the book then spills all the family secrets. Um, and like Dick Tay, another feminist avant-garde Asian American classic, it's a book about how do you speak when your tongue has been cut out. It is a book of exorcism of ghosts, but it is also, I think, a book of summoning, a book of summoning these ghosts from the past who otherwise would not be able to speak. In I Want a Broad Margin to My Life, uh, there's a section where Maxine says, it's very difficult to remember all of these places and people into being. Uh, every day, we are slowly forgetting things. And I, too, am slowly falling into forgetting. And I think for all of you in this room, against that, what we can do is speak the purpose of the Asian American Writers Workshop, which is to write. And as she tells one character in the book near the end, talk, talk, 
talk. So let's give a hand to Maxine. Thank you, Ken. That was the most beautiful description of uh, and appreciation of the woman warrior. I also want to thank Ken and the Asian American Writers Workshop and honor them for for the most um, wonderful, useful, helpful work. Um, I was so very influenced by that um, that uh, witnessing that we did at the border. Um, the, uh, I mean, I, I, I felt so good that um, Asian Americans who have, uh, we have found a place here, and uh, now we are going to, help support the people coming across the southern border. Um, there were many things that I learned. Uh, I think one of the most shocking ones was that our bus got stopped at three checkpoints, and they were on our side of the border. This was in Arizona. Uh, and I kept thinking, checkpoints in the US? I mean, I, I, I understand the checkpoints right at the border, but we were checked all along the way to uh, Tucson. Um, uh, uh, I, I knew the, the fence was there. Oh, that, that's an interesting thing, too. It's, it, it's called the fence. And now all of a sudden we're calling it the wall, and and uh, and and we're saying let's build a wall. Well, there's already a wall there, and and um, you'd be surprised how many people don't know that there is a wall or a fence uh, already. Um, so I am going to um, read to you a. Um, uh, some lines about uh, immigration. And uh, as I say that word, I noticed that Ken kept using the word immigration too. And I was just uh, talking to a Viet Tan Yuan whose new book is called The Refugees. And what he said was, stop calling them immigrants. You call them refugees. And then the whole attitude is different. There's a different feeling, uh, a more compassionate feeling that we have when we call them refugees. Um. Okay, this is uh, from uh, I Love a Broad Margin to My Life. And in this context, you can hear the word margin, not just uh, margin like in a piece of paper, but border. A margin is also a border. And uh, this is, uh, oh, it's, it's about me and I am on an airplane. And uh, okay, so here's the way it goes. And this is about generations of people uh, migrating across borders. And, uh, and we, are, um, we are connected, we're intertwined. And so uh, there, there's me and my mother, but I'm like my mother. I'm also like this person that I'm traveling with. And, uh, and uh, it's like we're all, of, we're all of humanity and we're moving. Once I was on an airplane beside a village girl in the window seat. At takeoff, I asked her, where are you going? Wah! She shouted in surprise and grabbed a hold of my hand. You speak like me. Yes, I speak Sayup language. Are you from the village? No. My mama and papa came from Sayup villages. They left for New York. They lived in New York, then California. I was born in California. 
I felt like a child, younger than this girl. I'm telling about parents as if I still had them. I'm talking in my baby language. Wah, she exclaimed loud as though yelling across the fields. I am going to New York. I am meeting my husband in New York. He's waiting for me in New York. He works in a restaurant. He's rented a home. He sent for me and waits for me. She did not let go of my hand. I held hers tightly as we flew the night sky. She looked in wonder at webs of lights below. Red, red, green, green, she said. Red, red, green, green, my mother used to say, meaning, oh, how pretty. The lights were white and yellow, too, and gold, blue, copper, and above, stars and stars. Mother, mama, as you leave the village family you'll never see again, Grandfather walked her as far as he could walk, stood weeping in the road until she could not see him anymore when she turned around to look. She's off to that lonely country from where he returned broke. I felt that I was dying. Mama, girl, you are not traveling alone. I am, traveling, I, I am traveling with you here, holding your hand. I know that country you're leaving for and shall guide you there. I know your future. I'm your child from the future. Your husband will certainly meet you. Baba will be at the East Broadway station. You will recognize each other though he be dressed modern Western style. You will have a good, good life. You will have many children and live a long, long life. You will be lucky. You are lucky. Your husband has work. He's rented an apartment and made you a home. He saves money. He bought your plane ticket. He will be waiting for you at the airport. She listened to the wise old woman teaching her. But how to instruct anyone, but how to instruct anyone the way to make an American life? How to have a happy marriage? For a long time, in the dark, dozing, dreaming, thinking, we sat without speaking, without letting go of warm hands. The red, red, green, green appeared again. I told her, that's Japan. We're over Japan now. We'll be landing soon in Narita. Wah, you speak Japanese too. She admires me too much. Inside the horrible confusion of the international airport, how can a mind from the village not fall to crazy pieces? I found a nice American couple making the connecting flight to New York and asked them please to take this Chinese girl to the right gate. She thanked me. She said goodbye. See you again. Joy Kin. She did not look back. Good. Gotta go. Things to do. People to meet places to be. Okay, so now here we are um, celebrating the woman warrior who is f 40 years old. And, uh, and during those 40 years, I have felt very dissatisfied with this book. I made so many mistakes. Uh, <laughs> The <laughs> I made all these mistakes, and I forgot. You know, I'd left out that she was a weaver, and I, and I, I, I just made this uh, heroic story, and uh, and so, um, so, so I kept. I, I have changed it. Uh, in uh, in the fifth book of peace, I. Uh, 
I wrote, wrote it as a chant and as a poem rather than in prose. So that was one of the changes that I made. Uh, but then I continued to be dissatisfied. And, um, and then I found out new information. And uh, it's such terrible information that I am glad that I did not tell it to you because uh, I wanted The Woman Warrior to be an inspirational story. And, uh, and, and then I found out how she died. And uh, she was a suicide. And so how could I tell that? That's too terrible. Um, I don't want to discourage us. I don't want to discourage myself. Um, and so in I Love a Broad Margin to My Life, I just thought, OK, I got to tell it. And uh, so I do it through filters to tell such an unbearable thing. Uh, so I, I have my um, fictional character, Whitmana Singh. He's the one that hears it. So I hear it through him. Uh, and so I mean, I, in a way, I try to make it as, le as least shocking as possible. So in a way, it's not dramatic. Um, it starts off, uh, there's a monk who's calling him to go to the graveyard and saying, Layla, Layla, which means, come on, come on. Layla, Layla, now to the hillside with a willow stream that's a graveyard. This stone like a door marks the grave of Fa Muklan, woman warrior. Over Whitman's shoulder, I can read each word of her name. She killed herself, says the monk. She hung herself. No, no, why? I can't believe it, why? The emperor heard the mighty general was a woman in disguise, a brave and beautiful woman who'd gone to war as a man. He sent for her to be a wife. She refused, and he placed her under house arrest. She killed herself at home. No, no. She can't be the Fa Muklan who's the woman warrior I told about, we all tell about, many women named for her. And the monk's speech, a rare dialect issuing from the habit of silence, hard to understand. She couldn't have killed herself. She couldn't have found life after war, life as a woman, useless to live. How to go on without her? Whitman has to find a way, and I have to find my own way. Okay, so as, uh, as, this, as this long poem continues, I tried to um, find a meaning for her suicide, as we try to find meanings for everything. And so uh, towards, the, um, towards the end of the book, I arrive at a, um, a museum in Xi'an. And it's just a dusty little museum. In Xi'an, there's a museum, like the museum I made as a kid for my collections. Strange things I picked up along the railroad tracks, and in the slough, and in the cash register. Deer hoof, a baby bat, counterfeit money, fool's gold. Behind dusty glass, there lay the arrow with knock whistle that I'd invented for the barbarians who played the reed pipe. The poet's imagination flies true. It works. It hit on the actual. It can make up a thing that will materialize in China, in time, the past, the future. So at the walled city of West Peace, I come to the start of the Silk Road, which forks southwest. The way 
Tripitaka Tang and Monkey Sun Wukong went questing, betakes you to India. Northwest, you'd end up in Afghanistan, then Iran, then Uruk, home of Gilgamesh, Iraq. Peace groups invite me to these places, but I turn them down. I don't want my heart to break. Famuklan would go. She'd join the army of whichever side held her family hostage. She'd win battles and receive honorable discharge home, though the 1,000 years war is not done. Now I know. She killed herself. She had PTSD. Her soldier's heart broke and she fell upon her sword. This month, May 2009, more American soldiers died by their own hand than killed by Iraqis and Al-Qaeda. So far this year, 62 suicides, more than half of them National Guard, 138 in 2008. I have no words of consolation. Okay, so, of course, I don't like having no words of consolation. I don't like having no words. So, uh, so I'm going to read you a section in which there is resolution from that first story in The Woman Warrior, where my aunt commits suicide. And uh, so, uh, let's see, I, I figured that was in about 1920s. And so here we are almost 100 years after that suicide. And uh, so 100 years later, I come to some uh, resolution. And in a way, I had to invent the resolution. I had to take it from whatever happens. Uh, this is my uh, cousin speaking. Layla, Layla, come, come see the new temple. We hurried back through the village. The temple holding the east side of the plaza looked as, at, as I had seen it 23 years ago. Up high, on the tympanum, one big word, hong, soup. It looks important, and it looks funny. The first king of the first dynasty was named Soup. So the oracle bones say, in famine, in illness, slow boil in water, leaves and bark and grasses, scraps, whatever everybody has, never the seeds for planting. Drink soup, be well. The water for making life-saving soup came from this well, this well beside me, this well centered in the village, in the village square, this well in front of the temple. My aunt killed herself and she killed the baby in this well. I looked down into it but did not see a very deep hole. I did not see the eye that reflects stars. The water came to the top of the well. It seemed to be drawn up through porous stone, but inches away, ankle deep. My aunt with a baby couldn't possibly have jumped into a well this shallow and drowned. A crone, we, shriveled to my size, gripped my hand tight in her hand which was cold and clammy. She said, you and I are very related. We are Ho Chun. I thought, don't touch me. <laughs> I don't want to catch your disease. I felt her hard bones around my wrist, my arm. In her other hand was a bowl of water. She let go of me and with both hands offered me water water from the well. Her hand was cold and wet because of clear, clean well water. 
I touched the water as cold as though iced. I touched it with both hands, put both hands into the water, then touched my forehead, touched my eyes, and held my palms against my cheeks, held my face in my hands. I am blessing myself and my aunt and all that happened. Earl did as I did, the crone standing be before him, proffering the bowl of water. On this hot day, we did not drink. The water was not meant for us to drink. The crowd was not looking at us. When a Chinese crowd will gather and look at anything, watch who wins the haggling, watch the street barber cut hair, watch anybody write anything, the villagers were looking away, knowing we had shame, we had curse. They gave us privacy, gave us face. Are they wondering whether I am wondering, do they know? Do they know that I know? The crone woman, now where is she? Is she old enough to have witnessed the raid on our house? The people at the old folks club, have they taken part? Killing the animals, hounding my aunt? The men, one of those men, her rapist, her lover? She gave birth in the pigsty. She drowned, and the baby drowned in this very well. Are these things ever past? Kids saw. Can you ever get over it? Sex, bad. Birthing, bad. Woman, bad. So, lifetimes later, a strange old lady brings to me and my husband a bowl of water. She holds it in her two hands. Chinese will serve ordinary tea with the attention of both hands. I hope she means to be making ceremony. I shall take it to be shriving. The bad we did be over. Punishment be over. Suffering be over. Is that it then? Wet my hands in the well water, the bowl like the well, and my wet face like my sinful ants. Perhaps the well water is being offered innocently. I, the only one who remembers the past and believes in history's influence and believes ritual settles scores. My husband by my side, blessing himself as if, as if with the holy water of his youth, stands in for the rapist lover. Forgiven, curse lifted, war over. Now, it's my honor to introduce our interlocutor tonight, Monique Trung, uh, a winner of a Guggenheim Fellowship and a Young Lions Award from the New York Public Library, um, as well as the author of A Book of Salt and Bitter in the Mouth. Uh, let's give all Monique a hand in another round for Maxine. Hello, is this mic on? Yes? Okay, great. Um, okay. You know, um, I, I'm trained as a lawyer, so um, I 
approach this with sort of the madness and the obsession of a lawyer. Um, <laughs> so at a certain point, I realized I was actually not going to cross-examine you. <laughs> so I needed just to dial it back a little bit. So this is what I'm trying to do. Okay. Um, <laughs> the first thing is that I, uh, I, I want to know um, if it's okay if I call you MHK. <laughs> well, it does sound like Martin Luther King, MLK. Exactly. Exactly. It sounds like MLK. That sounds good. It's, it sounds good? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll okay. take it, I'll take it. <laughs> I'm, okay, great, because I was also thinking MLK, JFK, MFK Fisher, also one of my favorite writers. Um, and I, I want to call you that because to me, Maxine just seems too informal. And also, I'm Vietnamese American, and to me, I need to add an honorific to the to your name. So, um, you know, it would have to be, you know, back Maxine or Yi Maxine. Um, uh, oh, Yi sounds just like Chinese. It means auntie, you know? Ah. <laughs> okay, we're going to go with MHK. Okay. <laughs> just because I, I do think it's heroic sounding, it's visionary um, sounding, and that to me is very fitting for you. <laughs> So I've never been called that before. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh, ooh. <laughs> well, um, I'm honored that you'll let me try that out on you. So um, I wanted to begin by um, um, showing everyone that I brought with me <laughs> um, my copy of The Woman Warrior, which is the 1977 paperback um, vintage books edition. And uh, I actually don't remember uh, where I bought this. I think it might have been in New Haven in 86 or in 87. But I'll tell you something that I do remember, which is that um, I remember getting into a very loud, very um, angry um, sort of confrontation with the um, manager of a bookstore in Berkeley, California. <laughs> and this was in, I think this was in the summer of 89, because I found copies of The Woman Warrior shelved in the anthropology section of the bookstore. Now, I remember opening up the title page of the of you know one of the books and said, "Do you see anthropology written on this?" <laughs> and um, you know, I mean, clearly, the the anger I was feeling was that it to me anthropology is is data and science, and your book uh, is clearly clearly within the realm of the creative arts. So, you know, I'm sure that questions of characterization and classification by your publisher, your editor, reviewers, booksellers, readers, um, these questions must have been ongoing, right? So, you know, especially, I mean, when what you've written is such a genre-defying groundbreaking feminist Asian American work. So I thought we could begin by um, just asking you some, you know, perhaps if you could share with us some of the hurdles or surprises, let's say, that you encountered as a first time author uh, trying to get this book through that publishing process in, in the mid-70s. Well, I, I totally understand how, what you uh, were saying to the book publisher, seeing it under anthropology, because I would see it in sociology, or, I, and it, or it would be under Asia, or uh, 
and, it, and uh, or, or Asian American studies. Um, and when the book first came out, uh, f feminism was was uh, really rising, and I thought I I do not want this to be uh, reviewed as a feminist book, and uh, and so you know right away uh, it was in Ms. Magazine as uh, as one of the uh, oh, uh, one of the uh, intellectual uh, arguments for feminism. And uh, so, uh, and, uh, it, oh, and also it, it would be under, sh shelved under China and, and, uh, and, oh, and, oh, and also when people try to find me at the university, they go to the Asian American Studies Department um, and nobody thinks it's, I mean, the English department, but in a way English, it, sometimes being in the English department, you're a traitor, you know, to your race because you're not over there with, with the brothers and sisters. Um, so for a while, I was feeling really uh, bad when I uh, when I saw it in different places, but then all of a sudden, uh, I thought, well, I'm not being pigeonholed at all because in, it's in so many different categories. Uh, it was, I even found it in, under uh, black studies, you know, uh, <laughs> under African-American lit. And uh, so it is, uh, uh, it's under fiction, it's in, in nonfiction. And uh, so um, there's a linguistic, uh, uh, term it's it's called etc. So yes, I am. A, I am. I I can write anthropology. I can write. Uh, I can bl write. Uh, you know. I can write anything. Well, um, that's that's a wonderful way to look at it. And I wish that I had, um, in my youth, <laughs> understood the the fulsomeness yeah, of you, you know. It, it, during that time, I, I don't think it happens so much now, but there was a way of reviewing our work that would only look at it as, uh, as uh, uh, but they wouldn't review it as art. You know, it, it's, it's only as a representative of, uh, of those people. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, um, Ken, when he introduced you, talked about how you, you thought of the work as a memoir. Is, is that, was that how it was acquired by Knopf? No, no, okay. I did not think of it as oh, a memoir. Okay. I did not. Uh, I, I thought of these as personal essays. Oh, okay. um, and uh, I, uh, I, I was in the Knopf offices and they were trying to think of the title because I didn't have a title. I'm very bad at naming things and uh, I, uh, I, I just worked without a title. And actually I, I thought of Gold Mountain Stories and uh, my editor said, uh, this is not gonna sell. You, you cannot call it gold. In the first place, it sounds like a bunch of short stories, and that doesn't sell. And also, there were some books out that year with the word gold in it, another title. They had mountain and other titles. And, uh, and so, so it was uh, my editor, uh, Chuck Elliott. Uh, he was a, a, a foreign, foreign correspondent for Life magazine in China. And so he called it the woman warrior, and it's e either him or the Knopf uh, marketing people who called it mem memoirs. And at that time, the word memoirs was brand new; um, it was not overused. Mm -hmm. And and I thought, well, that's good because memoirs has that. You know, the bad thing about calling it memoirs is that. Uh, well, it's just the way you remembered it, you know. <laughs> it might not have happened, but you remember it that way. I don't like that part because I think I have a very accurate memory. And uh <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I was also curious, um, you know, um, about that subtitle. So, th so it really was not something that came 
with the manuscript mm -mm. from the you. The whole thing came from my publisher. Ah. Yeah. And I did not like Woman Warrior either because oh. I, th I, uh, I was becoming more and more pacifist, and I think, what am I doing with a book that has a war in the title? <laughs> We're going to follow up on that, because um, I think that oh, is. And then uh, then uh, my editor, uh, Chuck, he also said, well, you know who the woman warrior is in the book. And I was saying, well, it's Fa Mulan, or it's Cyan. Or it's my mom, and he says, no, it's you. <laughs> and I thought, ah. <laughs> <laughs> A reluctant warrior, yeah. okay. Um, let's, I, I, um, I'm also curious to know about the, the cover. And I, I know that the hardcover um, edition had a different image, but, did, were you happy with the cover design? Did you, were you, there were moments where you thought, what, what's happening to my book? <laughs> um, I was very, very careful with okay. covers and w that I, I, I looked at everything in uh, looking for stereotypes and trying to prevent stereotypes. And that happens even to this day, even uh, the latest book, I Love a Broad Margin mm -hmm. to My Life. Uh, that came out with, to me, it looked like Chinese wallpaper. And, uh, and I, uh, you know, I, I refused that cover. By this time, I did have some say over the cover, <laughs> and I refused it. Uh, I ended up, I'm okay with this cover, um, you mm -hmm. know, it, it's not bad. I mean, she's, she's dressed in a sweater and a, <laughs> and a skirt. I mean, she's not in a Cheong Sam or I'll Die. Uh -huh. Okay, so one, one reason that I was so careful, the first uh, chapter of The Woman Warrior found publication in a magazine called Viva. It was sort of like, a, it was like soft porn for women. And and uh, and so it, it's now out of print, um, but there is the whole first chapter. It came out before the book came out, and there is full page illustration. And here are these. Uh, uh, there's these women, and they are dressed in kimonos with obis, they're looking out the window, and there's Mount Fuji in the <laughs> background. <laughs> so that started me on just watching everything. Wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that was a little unexpected about <laughs> Viva. <laughs> but, I, you know, I, I begin with these questions because I, I thought that they would reveal to us, and I think they have, your responses, that, that some things have changed, you know, for Asian American authors, but many things have actually stayed the same. Um, the, um, the threat of having the kimono <laughs> on your cover or um, Chinese wallpaper, you know, it's, it's still there, sadly, four years after, you know, a publication as incredible as yours. Um, you know, um, I, I want to move on to something that you wrote in The Woman Warrior. Um, you wrote, the swords woman and I are not so dissimilar. What we have in common are the words on our backs. The idioms for revenge are report a crime um, and report to five families. The reporting is the vengeance, not the beheading, not the gutting, but the words. And I have so many words. First of all, that is so badass. <laughs> <laughs> and I thank you for that, because I remember reading that um, as a younger woman, and I think the, the word that came to me then was badass. <laughs> But you know, when I when I read this, 
the reporting is the vengeance. You know, it, it said to me that, that Famuglan was, is in, you know, is arguably your literary progenitor. You know, a role model for what it means to be the following thing, a writer, a woman, a Chinese American. Now, if that is an apt description of your literary relationship to the Famuglan um, legend. Um, do, you, do you think and do you still think of the written word as a form of revenge? And if yes, against whom? I think I've gotten less vengeful as I get older. Uh, uh, revenge doesn't seem to be s such a value. Uh, but I do, um, I, I, uh, it's not just revenge, but um, uh, uh, reconciliation, finding meaning, resolution. Uh, uh, and, um, you know, revenge is one of the things that we do, but uh, compassion is is a um, is a goal and a light for me as I write. And what I mean by compassion is that um, a writer uh, can see other people's point of view, and uh, we can empathize. We can uh, put our consciousness into somebody uh, whom we utterly uh, despise and hate, and and we can be uh, in the point of view of our enemy, and uh, when we uh, have uh, that ability to see from others' point of view, uh, then we uh, make connections, uh, and uh, somebody does something bad, and we don't just take revenge, uh, we understand them and and uh, and become one of them and also recognize that I am like that other person and uh, so uh, my goals for my writing um, actually even as I was writing this I knew that revenge wasn't the highest form of moral order and uh, so I was working on um, uh, understanding finding meaning and also trying to uh, make community uh, as I, uh, uh, I notice uh, uh, to report to five families. I mean, there are families and there are uh, families that get together and there are groups of people who have similar understanding and consider themselves family. So um, I, I have many, many, um, uh, uh, hopes for for what writing can do. Well, I, I think that in many ways your your response has already um, sort of addressed this this next question that I'm going to ask you, and it it had to do with the fact that. Um, uh, the, the question comes from the fact that in the fifth book of peace, uh, which was also with Knopf in 2003, yes, um, you, you rewrote the Famuklan. Yes, I did. Right, and you read this tonight about that, um, the fact that she committed suicide because of PTSD. And I read that and it, I just thought it was such a devastating conclusion for this for this, your rewriting of The Woman Warrior. But I think it, it made a lot of sense to me, uh, given the work that you've done subsequently um, uh, with veterans, with the writing workshops that you've done with them. I think it, that must have come, that your reconsideration of The Woman Warrior must have come from these experiences that you've had, yes? Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and don't forget that uh, I have two brothers who were uh, in in the Vietnam War, and uh, and then most of the veterans I've worked with are veterans of of the American War in Vietnam, and so yes, I I uh, 
I, I, I can see, feel their uh, PTSD and, uh, and you know, the, uh, as I bring the Falmulan story into, into our time and into this place, uh, then I am inventing uh, a, a new story. Uh, the, uh, so, so all of that, that I, you know, I made it up about the PTSD and, uh, and that, uh, and, uh, but it, it, as you say, it, it rings true. Be um, the, uh, her, oh gosh, it, it's such a strange thought. Okay, I'll come back to it later. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. Um, well, I'm, I, in the fifth book of peace, you also, it's in the epilogue, you write about um, protesting with Code Pink on International Women's Day on, um, I think it was March 8th of 2003, and that you were arrested on that day along with 20 other women writers. Um, in your most recent book, I Love a Broad Margin to My Life, you revisit that day, um, this day of female solidarity, anti-war protests, nonviolent resistance. And you share with us a, just a remarkable uh, set of details, including whom you shared your holding cell with that day. Um, all done in narrative verse, of course. Um, and I, I want to blurt it out, but I'd rather. <laughs> it's so amazing to me. Um, but I, I would love it if you could talk a little bit about that day, um, including your cellmate, um, and what lessons have stayed with you from mm -hmm. that moment, and, and what we can take with us as, as we engage uh, in acts of resistance now. Um, okay, first of all, okay, I'll, I'll just get to the part where they put me in the cell, and uh, so they open this door and put me in there, and uh, and they lock it, you know, this heavy metal door, and inside there's a there's a little bench over here, and then there's a toilet, open toilet. And I walked in there, and I said, oh, this is great. I'm alone. Uh, this is like, this must, this must feel like solitary confinement. I like it. Uh, and you, what this comes from is, you know, I, I am such an introvert. And I, uh, it's always been my fantasy that uh, I could be like Dostoevsky and check off, you know, and they, and they put me in jail, and I have all the time in the world to read and write, and nobody to bother me, and no phone calls, nothing. And so I enjoyed that for quite a while. And so, um, and then the, uh, then the door opened, and I, uh, oh no, you know. And then there was, the door opened, and there was a black man and a black woman standing there. And the black man was a cop. And he says, oh, my wife is going to kill me. I arrested Alice Walker. <laughs> and so Alice comes in. And we spent a whole time bonding alone together, the two of us. In, in the cell, it was so great. And um, so I let her sit on the bench and I sat on the floor at her feet. And, uh, and I can't remember what we talked about, but I remember we, we, um, we were very close. And, uh, and we, uh, oh, you know, we knew each other from before, so it wasn't like a brand new meeting. But my impression was, 
I mean, there was this little person, and she was sitting on this little bench, and she was, she had her feet up, and, um, and to me, she looked like, uh, sometimes she looked like a baby, and sometimes she looked like a, a little girl, and sometimes like an old, old crone woman. And all of that would uh, flash uh, through her. And uh, uh, very, and she was dark. Uh, the way, you know, I describe yin as dark and pink. During the demonstration, we saw pink clouds manifest um, because it was totally peaceful. There were no, um, riots or anything. It, um, it was palpable peace and love. Um, so, so pink is the color of yin, but dark black is also. It's the night. Um, yang is the sun. Uh, yin is like um, it's it's that it's all of space. Uh, it's all of time and history, and I could see that, 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 like a, it's not like a black hole, but it's like, uh, it's the yin darkness, um, and, and time, it was still, but it was also going back and forth, because I saw her as a, as a girl, and a baby, and an old woman, um, and all the time beautiful, um, yeah, so so we just sat like that, and and I have a feeling, um, but but I I know that the way I come across too, because I'm also little like her, and and uh, and I I also can be uh, childish and babyish, and so I think uh, we were sitting there, like going through our babyhood together, and then we were girls together, and then we were, uh, then we were old ladies, and and we were just. Sitting there, um, yeah. Oh, not this time, but another time I met her. Um, the uh, I don't know. We got into hair, and so, and she was showing me how black hair works. You know how it's got all these little hooks, and, and you can twirl it and twirl it, and, and then you get this nice curl, and then and then she could touch mine. You know, uh, um, you know, really straight and. <laughs> So we have that, but we've had that before. So, so we didn't do any hair touching this time. <laughs> okay. Oh, and then after that, the door opens, and it was, oh no! So we're gonna have to break this up with the two of us. And then they let in a whole bunch of other women, um, and they were all singing, and so we were all singing, and uh, we were singing this little light of mine. And we were so loud um, that the police told us to quiet down because they couldn't hear to book us. And, uh, but one of the people that was in our cell was Terry Tempest Williams. And uh, oh, I, I, during the whole demonstration, when it was ever, whenever it was getting scary, uh, Terry would go like this. I love you, Maxine. Oh. Yeah, she did that. And, uh, and so I remember that. It, it, it's important to me, always. I can hear her voice, and I can feel her, uh, her hand. Uh, so she's one of the people in our cell. And then, um, and then it's getting crowded. Hours go by, and the toilet is getting like pretty bad. And, uh, and there's no way to flush it. We look all over, you can't flush it. Uh, but Terry, she's a, um, she's a veteran. Uh, I mean, she's been in jail lots of times. And she knows what to do. And so she's like banging on the door. She's trying to talk to those people out there. And somebody opens this little hole and, and she says, please, sir, will you flush the toilet? And they flush it from the outside. See, so so this is valuable stuff. I mean, uh, okay. Next time you're in jail. Oh, another thing, in the demonstration, bring your ID, because 
I put my ID in a secret place in my purse, and I couldn't find it. It was so secret. <laughs> and, and then they were saying, okay, the big sell for you tonight. And, and, and so, you know, without my ID, they were going to put me in jail, the big jail. I mean, this was the penitentiary outside Washington, D.C., federal pen. Um, it, I was not going to be with these nice peaceful lady demonstrators. They weren't gonna put me in with the criminals, uh, but I managed to find my ID. And, um, and so, okay, so advice. Yes. Oh, you know how to flush the toilet yes. and bring your ID. Okay, that's what we learned. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> do, do you have more? to give us? Oh, more advice? Yes, I, I feel like we're all gonna be demonstrating for many years, <laughs> you know, so. Uh -huh. Yeah, you, uh, you find your peace, you find peace, and then, uh, and then you have a peace with others, and it reverberates and grows, and uh, I know it sounds like magic, and Ken said wonder, but okay, this is true. Um, there were, I don't know, maybe a couple thousand people, and we were practicing nonviolence, the way Martin Luther King and the way Gandhi taught us, nonviolence. We felt peace in our hearts. Uh, Okay, I'm from California, but the peace vibes, the peace vibes actually go out to one another. And, um, and we made peace. Um, okay, this is the only peace demonstration I've ever been on, okay? Which means I have been on demonstrations, but they were not peaceful. This was full peace. And when that happens, there is love that is palpable. We feel it for one another, and we see it. And I'm not crazy. Other women saw it, too. There were big, the atmosphere turned pink, and there were big balls of pink. And, um, and we threw it uh, toward Ara Iran, uh, trying to... Uh, Oh, that was Iraq. And we were tr throwing it to try, to try to send it over there. And then we threw the peace balls over to the White House. <laughs> and, uh, um, but you know, later I think, oh, that's kind of crazy. It sounds like a hallucination. Um, <laughs> but so I wrote it down, you know, so I wrote it down. So that, you know, when you write it down, it's, it's more true. <laughs> Okay, um, before I open this up to questions from the audience and in the internets, um, I, um, I would l absolutely love it and consider it a blessing if you could read the last two paragraphs from the epilogue of the fifth book of peace. And I, to me, this sounds... Um, like a chant for peace. And I, I wanted to leave us with something um, hopeful, which you have right there. The images of peace are ephemeral. The language of peace is subtle. The reasons for peace, the definitions of peace, the very idea of peace have to be invented and invented again. Children, everybody, here's what to do during war. In a time of destruction, create something. A poem, a parade, a friendship, a community, a place that is the commons, a school, a vow a moral principle, one peaceful moment. Thank you. OK, 
Okay, so um, please, I'm, I'm begrudgingly handing over MHK to your questions. So um, please raise your hand, and it looks like we have a volunteer with, with uh, a mic. Hi, um, thank you so much for speaking. It was really beautiful and I'm really happy I'm here. And I'm also here with two of my classmates who uh, we all read The Woman Warrior together in our class. And actually our professor studied under you in UC Berkeley, which was really exciting. Um, but I, I guess like one of the things we kept talking about in our class, like one of the moments that in The Woman Warrior that we kept coming back to um, was this moment, I think it was in the Barbarian Reed Pipe, I think. Um, where there's that girl who's crying in the bathroom and the narrator is kind of almost harassing her basically to the point of like speak, right? Talk, talk. Um, and we were talking about in class how that's like a really, maybe one of the most violent moments in the book. Um, and it was a really bizarre one too. Like it doesn't, it feels very different to the rest of the book, I would say. Um, and we came up with our own theories about like why <laughs> this part was like, you know, written, but I would like to hear like what you were thinking in that process and like what that crying girl in the bathroom represents to you. Thank you. Uh, what were some of your ideas? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, this is, I might be not remembering very correctly, but I think we kind of talked about how um, Asian America is a construct as being for you in the Mormon warrior and what's so inspiring about it is it's so limitless and you can kind of create whatever you want with that because like what is Asian America right so um, so that the fact that you were so creative and boundary pushing and kind of like throughout all the rules about like what is China like what is Asia you know and um, but then this girl felt like an obstacle almost like she felt like a block and our, in our class, we talked a lot about how she almost represented something that finally the narrator could not access or could not, like it was not a create, you know what I mean? Like it wasn't, that was the point of, there was like a huge, like I can't access this girl. Like I can't be her. She's completely different to me. And there's no, I guess there's no creative force around her almost. Like she's just, it's a very violent scene. Um, so I don't know if that was what you were thinking, but that's what we came up with, so yeah. Well, to me, it wasn't almost harassment. It's bullying. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, yeah. And it's from the point of view of the bully, which I don't think that we get enough. You know, we always get the stories of the, of the victim, but this is uh, the bully. And the, it's my point of view, and uh, and as an individual uh, 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 child, I bullied uh, another child. Uh, we can even we can look at it in a bigger way. As an American, I have bullied others. Um, in but specifically in in that you were saying uh, you thought this girl um, is an obstacle, is that somebody that, that the bully could never be. Uh, the way I was looking at it is that um, that silent girl is, um, is something that I already am. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and uh, the uh, a, a sort of a silent, person, a sissy, uh, 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 too girly, uh, and uh, uh, not, uh, not American. She's a very nerdy uh, person. And so let's just beat that out of myself and get rid of that. And so maybe if I, uh, and she's a stereotype of the, of the sweet, silent, uh, 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 oriental uh, uh, girl and uh, well let's just beat that up and um, it, and thinking back on the, the ancestors of both of them um, the bully is thinking well if she had bound feet I would just 
step on them, and, and you know, and it is, it is, uh, it's trying to, uh, 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 to destroy uh, what one doesn't want to be. Um, I just read that to a high school class um, a couple of weeks ago, and I thought that that, that would really get to them. Um, and uh, but I, I I don't know whether it came across. I I I I um, as I read it, I thought, oh, this is going on too long, um, and and I think it is. Uh, uh, it's uh, a very strange thing to put into the book. Um, in in a classical story, you you get a, a conflict, a high point, and so the most violent, high uh, dramatic point of the woman warrior is this bullying with little girls. Uh, so um, so I, I try to put like. Uh, like all kinds of um, of conflict into a, uh, into people uh, it, it, into a pri people who are going through uh, primal growth. Uh, they're children, and already there's violence. Uh, this uh, trying to otherize another person. Um, so uh, so that it's, to me, that's what's going on. Also, it's sort of a confession because I did it, and and I thought, <laughs> oh, if I if I write it out, uh, maybe maybe you'll forgive me. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm so glad you asked that question because I actually had a whole page devoted to that scene, um, but it was it is so. It is so violent in, in this, I don't know if I, if that came across to me as that violent when I read it as a younger person, but this time around it did. But I'll, I'll MHK, <laughs> another thing that I, I got from that scene was I thought perhaps you were suggesting that there was strength in silence because you, as the bully, you never got a word from that girl. You know, she won in that sense, but mm. not really. She didn't win because, uh, <laughs> oh, well. because she needed the power of speech, mm. Mm. and uh, she never, um, and she never acquired it. I mean, mm. I know the story after the story. Mm. Uh, she's. Um, uh, you know, she's just become a recluse. Uh, she does not have a career. She does not have a family. She, she's just, that's her life. Uh, um, oh, one thing um, I hope you notice from that story, the, uh, even as I am doing the bullying and all of uh, the, and all the crying and all that's going on, um, uh, the bully, I don't know whether, uh, I shouldn't refer to her as me, I mean, she uh, likes to make up new words, and so she grabs a hair, and she pulls it, and she makes up a new word for it. I'm gonna honk your hair. <laughs> MHK just honked my hair. <laughs> um, uh, uh, questions about Yes. Oh. Hi. Uh, my name is Yaya, uh, and I'm a social worker. And something I've been thinking a lot about recently is the function of narrative and uh, how narrative helps to heal trauma. And um, thinking about how when trauma exists in silence, that's when cycles of trauma are perpetuated. And when we can create narratives around our traumas, that's when healing happens, and especially when communities can have cohesive narratives. Um, and that narratives also change, right? So to your point about memoir, um, narrative serves a function, right? So we have certain narratives, and 
um, maybe there to make sense of what has happened to us in the past and that the way that we make sense of what happens to us shifts over time. And that writing in particular and writing narratives accesses a different part of our brain than speaking or other ways of telling narratives. So I'm wondering as a writer and as someone who is um, telling your story in different ways and over time, um, how has the way that you've accessed the narrative um, changed and how have those narratives for you personally changed in your process of writing? Oh, I'm glad you gave that description of how narrative can transform lives. So for about 25 years, I've been leading a um, writing workshop for war veterans. And uh, it is my faith that um, when th they write their stories, uh, they um, come home from war, they, uh, they heal their wounds. Uh, they make sense of what happened to them uh, in war, and uh, and they write their way home. Um, and this uh, this writing is done in uh, silence. So we were just talking about uh, bullying this girl. Uh, uh, to get her out of the silence. Now that was a bad silence that she had. Um, it, it was like being a mute, and uh, and the bully is trying to get her to uh, break out of the bad silence. Okay, now as I am working with the veterans, um, we are uh, we ground ourselves in a good silence. And by that I mean that uh, the writing is in the context of, uh, of Buddhist meditation. And uh, so in there we, um, we learn uh, the good silence in which we can, uh, the silence that is peace and quiet uh, after the noisiness of war. And so we, uh, make silence in our meditation. Uh, so we also have eating meditation and walking meditation, which is very important because people had been marching in a military march or they've been walking on an earth that has mines in it. And so th they learn to walk in a, um, a trusting way on, on a beautiful piece of earth. And uh, so uh, much of the day is spent in silence uh, rather than chit chat. And uh, then when there is an urge to uh, communicate something, it goes into the writing. Um, okay, so we have been working for 25 years. And so in that time, um, I see the stories change, uh, stories that uh, uh, that find meanings, that find resolutions. Uh, the the uh, uh, the stories become whole, and and then the people become whole. Uh, so uh, so all whatever what do you say uh, uh, that ha happens to. Uh, uh, to people who write narrative, uh, it happens uh, to to hundreds of uh, 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 veterans, and uh, and then it also happens to me. I think there's a question on the right hand side of you. Hi, I'm really excited to be asking you a question. By the way. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to ask, um, since you've revealed that um, no na uh, that the woman warrior in the other book um, committed suicide, I haven't read that book yet. So um, I wanted to ask, how connected do you feel no name woman and woman warrior and um, the woman woman warrior herself are through their suicides, or do you see it as a form of resistance? Because my friend and I are also reading this book just read this book for a class and we were thinking about suicide a lot because it was such a 
such a flashpoint in the beginning of the book? Oh, I don't see how suicide can be resistance. I, I, you know, I, I, I um, you know, I. There are some veterans in the workshop who, you know, even though we do all this meditating and, and writing and all that, uh, they have killed themselves. And, uh, and it's, it's always a mystery. I don't know. And even though I uh, try to make some sense of it, it by saying the Famuglan uh, committed suicide, uh, and, and trying to find a meaning to it, I th there isn't any like uh, I, I don't find a, a way of consoling myself to figure out what it is, but I certainly uh, don't see it as a uh, resistance that could be very helpful. And even the woman warrior uh, or Famuglan's suicide um, and the grave. That might not even be true. Uh, so here's what I'm dealing with in, in all of my writing. Uh, is this true? Is it not true? Uh, it, it, it's, uh, oh, okay, here's another thing I found out, that, um, that there is a tourist spot in China and, and they have a, a marker, and they say this is the grave of Fa Muglan, uh, who committed suicide. But the, the, I was checking up with somebody, and they said, oh yeah, uh, you know, the Beijing Tourist Bureau, they put that in there. I, wow, so maybe this is something that's just for tourists. Uh, maybe it didn't happen. <laughs> Thank you. I, I know, I didn't answer your question. <laughs> I, I know. Uh, do, do you want to ask it again, or? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know, because I just wanted to kind of um, ask more about like your mindset in writing those like two scenes. Um, I guess I was kind of pushing a little bit for a certain response, but I, thank you for like saying what you did. <laughs> I think that each of those scenes was myself pushing to the next one, and as uh, right now, as far as I can tell, that um, I think for this time in, uh, in our history, to uh, take a look at, uh, at the suicides that are, in, that are happening right now in our wars, uh, that's where we are now. And, uh, and how can we make sense of that? Um, uh, the, uh, I can make better sense of Fa Muglan, who lived a thousand years ago, but those wars are still, the, our Iraq, uh, 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 Afghanistan, all that, uh, it's still happening right now. And so it's hard to make sense of it while it's happening. But it behooves us to think about the suicides in our military right now. And I must tell you that uh, women, uh, the women vets that I've met, uh, they, uh, they, have, they have all been raped and they have also uh, uh, been with their sisters when they committed suicide. So I'm not giving you any answers. I'm, I'm just giving you more questions. Good evening, Ms. Hong Kingston. Uh, it's an uh, honor to hear you live and in person this evening. Uh, my name is Grace Yoon, and I have been teaching, <coughs> excuse me, Asian American history uh, at colleges and universities in Connecticut. And um, I've, uh, I want to thank you so much for your woman warrior words transforming really um, the consciousness and, and the lives of uh, many of my students over many years. Um, I have always thought of you as a woman warrior but of peace and using your words as weapons for peace. And uh, tonight you made reference to um, asking a question about what writing can do and I just want to ask, um, 
how it is or how you do feel. I, I also understand that you had wanted to ask people, um, how do you feel about being you? Is that, <laughs> is that right? So I want to kind of uh, ask that kind of a question as to um, how does it feel having um, been responsible for putting together two very everyday ordinary words and entering them into the American lexicon decades ago and even now continuing to hear them recalled and invoked in the 21st century. Just a few months ago in January, helping to marshal an outpouring of mostly women across the country who would come together to stand together to send a message together, a collective message. Um, how does it feel, you know, what can writing do um, when you consider both the literary impact and historic impact that uh, the power of your words have had and continue to have. Thank you. Thank you. What were the two words that you were talking about? Woman warrior. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, okay, before I get to you, I just, I thought of an answer about the suicide. Um, <laughs> You were talking about it as an act of resistance, and I was saying impossible, but I, it, but it is an act of resistance. Don't forget the monks that uh, burned themselves to death, the immolation of, uh, uh, and the sacrifices of, uh, of the people who uh, killed themselves for peace. Um, and um, you know, it, it's we honor that, and uh, it seems to work, uh, but it's still very mysterious, because um, I, I've talked to Thich Nhat Han about this. Uh, he is a, at a monastery where some of the monks and nuns had burned themselves, and. Um, and he sees it as, um, okay, on the one hand, the number one precept in Buddhism is that uh, thou shall not kill. And so you don't kill other people, but you don't kill yourself either. But here are people who kill themselves for peace. And so how do you, um, how do you put this together? Uh, he did not have an answer to that, um, but, but he just points that out. Uh, so you do have a, an example of suicide as resistance. Okay, so you were asking about uh, how does it feel to be me? <laughs> and so that I have, uh, so I have put these words out into the world. Um, uh, I, uh, it, it feels very good that, uh, that I can communicate with so many people, that, uh, that I have, um, uh, that I can put my thoughts and my feelings into words so that other people can hear it. And it also feels good that ha to have opportunities like this where you can speak back to me um, so that we, we, we have this communication. And, and so there is communion taking place uh, through writing. Um, I also see that, um, that my books have become part of the, uh, of the canon of American literature. And, uh, and, and, and that, that's just great. <laughs> yes. Hi, um, so we have a few questions from the live stream. Um, and in turn, so just for the sake of time, I'm gonna give you three questions that people have asked, and you can either answer them all quickly or choose which one resonates with you the most. 
Um, the first one from Carolyn Cho is, what has been your favorite memory in creating your work? Uh, we have a question from Tom Ye, which he says, thank you, MHK, for your words and example. My question is this. Um, well, it's very long, but I think I can sum it up in how has um, spirituality, like specifically like Asian um, spirituality, affected your Asian American identity on a personal and artistic level? Um, and then one question from Asela. Um, I know you might get this question a lot, but what is your opinion on the lack of representation of Asian Americans in media, including novels? Um, or maybe even like broaden the question to be like, uh, how do you feel about contemporary Asian American literature? Um, those are the three questions. Oh, thank you. I think the uh, question about uh, spirituality would be the most fun to think about. Uh, the um, I I uh, came into the world with uh, with my um, especially my mother uh, always. Uh, 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 speaking, speaking to my grandparents, and, and the pictures of my grandparents, and she's talking to them, and there is the incense and the and the oranges and the uh, 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 the roast pig and and uh, and always the holidays came on. Um, the solstice, the equinox, uh, both solstices, both equinoxes, and New Year's, and and uh, and and many many uh, rituals, and uh, uh, and with no explanations, and there were always spirits, always around, and uh, they would be doing all kinds of things, uh, mostly losing things. Uh, things disappear all the time. And, and uh, so I, I did live in this world of ghosts, I call it, in the book. And, um, and then I, I uh, uh, older, uh, then um, there was a there was a Chinese Methodist church in Stockton. And, uh, and you went there not because you're a Methodist or a Christian, but you went there because you're a Chinese. And, and so then we, uh, we did that. So I do have a, uh, a, a reading of, of the Bible and, uh, and Christian teachings. But... Uh, when they asked uh, us to be baptized, my mother took us out of the church immediately. Um, then uh, we we had to wear dog tags because uh, you know when the bomb comes, then they'll be able to identify our bodies. And uh, so on our dog tags, we had to put what religion we were. And um, and so all the. And so all the everybody said you either had to be a C or a P, either a Catholic or a Protestant. And so, and my parents, uh, my mother, no, you can't put that. So when I said, well, well, then what are we? And she said, oh, we're Confucius. And and uh, and so we went to school and they put a, a zero. And so. And then they also put your blood type. So I've got a zero and I got another zero. And so then, um, uh, then um, in, uh, when I was about college age, I, was, I really enjoyed the beatniks and all their writing and all that Buddhist stuff that uh, Jack Kerouac and, and Gary Snyder and Philip Whalen were doing. And, and that kind of, uh, uh, it, to me, it was uh, uh, intellectual. It, it was not spiritual. It was not m mythic, uh, but it's uh, uh, it, 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 it's a, a good uh, ethics, and uh, and I liked the little bit of spirituality, which was the meditation, um, and 
then um, I met uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, and, uh, and he taught, like, he, you could go for three or four days and in the silence, the meditation, the, the, uh, the walking meditation, the hugging meditation, which he learned uh, from Martin Luther King, what, but uh, that's another story. Uh, and so um, I was with uh, Thich Nhat Hanh when he gathered uh, veterans from Vietnam and from the United States, and he led them in uh, meditation. And, uh, and I, I, I was with him uh, several times doing this, and then I thought, you know, those veterans need something more than meditation. They need more than uh, spirituality. They need more than Buddhism. And what they need is writing. They need an art. So within Thich Nhat Hanh's um, uh, retreats, I led writing retreats. And so we um, combined spirituality and an art. And so I, I just became more and more Buddhist. But then, um, being more educated, I could look back on the rituals that my mother did and I, I now understand them. I, I can see they were Taoist, and um, so one day I was uh, I was talking to Gary Snyder, and I was saying, you know, um, do, oh, actually we were on a plane to China, and when I talked to him, and I said, uh, you know, uh, in China, uh, don't you think there's an integration of uh, Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism, that it all goes together? Because I was describing what my experience was. And so I asked this question, and you know what he said? He said, no. Because, <laughs> and I look at it, he's a very, very pure Zen guy. And, and he said, no. Um, so I continue to pursue this question, and I now understand, and I, I have heard this from, from uh, scholars and from people, um, this, there is something that combines uh, Buddhism, Confucianism, and Taoism. And you know what they call it? They call it the Chinese religion. <laughs> Is there um, anyone with questions? Ah, front row. Hello. Um, so this question comes from a bit of a personal space, but um, my parents were the ones who immigrated, and I speak very poor Chinese, like third grade, kindergarten level Chinese. So I would just wanted to hear from you, since I noticed that you had dedicated The Woman Warrior to your mother and father, did they ever get a chance to read it, whether in the original format or in translation format? And did they ever, did you, do you feel that they understood your intentions and your nuances? Because I find that a lot gets lost in translation when trying to speak to you know, your parents. <laughs> uh, my parents read it in Chinese translation. And I think the Chinese translation is very poor and uh, simple, and therefore they loved it. And <laughs> And they don't know. My mother did did not know how angry I could get at her, and uh, she. Uh, I think they translated, you know, like a soap opera, you know, a simple, nice story. And uh, so, um, so I feel okay about the version that they got. <laughs> Okay, I'm well. I, I think we're we're through with the question uh, and answer portion, and now we're moving on to the giveaway portion. <laughs> <Woo>. <laughs> 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 um, so we're going to ask Monique and Maxine to reach into this really great vintage AWW tote bag, and um, they're each going to draw a raffle ticket. 
and one winner will get a tote bag with a set of Monique's books. We have Bitter in the Mouth and the Book of Salt, and one winner will get a set of Maxine's books, um, which is all of the Penguin Random House vintage titles. So who would like to go first? Round of applause, please. Five, nine, six, four, six, three. Anybody? Oh, woo! <laughs> Come on up. It's like a bingo game. Yes. I love it. <laughs> and what she's getting is the brand new, fresh off the press, brand new edition of the Woman Warrior for the 40th anniversary. <laughs> Well, this is very much the consolation prize, you guys, because there's only two books in here, and it'll be years before there's another one. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so, uh, ooh, I have a name. Uh, Laura Tae Yang? Laura Tae Yang? What, what is your name? Lorelai. Oh, Lorelai Yang, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so we're going to set up a table in the front here for the authors to sit down and sign books. So instead of swarming them, give them a chance to get some wine, water, take a break. Um, we have books for sale. Um, we have plenty of wine to go. Please drink every last drop. Um, a big thanks to our event staff, to Verso, and we have one last thing. Not to put you on the limelight, but we have one for you. And we have one for you as well. The bouquets are from Saffron. Um, they're located right in Brooklyn. It's a brother and sister florist shop. And they basically, they have an option where you can select omakase and they kind of do it up. But yeah.